Coming up, earthquake. A massive 6.8 magnitude earthquake struck Morocco late last week. We talked with a scientist to better understand what happened. Game, set, match. Coco Goff becomes the first teenager to win the U.S. Open since 1999. We'll recap her exciting win and tell you how she handles the pressure of the game. The power of kindness. We catch up with our friend Lily Dubose and find out how she's helping kids who lost everything in the Maui wildfires. We'll test your knowledge of a popular school supply with a pop quiz. Actor Matthew McConaughey is telling us all about what inspired him to write his first children's book. We dream something. A lot of times we're told, oh, don't worry about that. That's just a dream. You know, just deal with what's in front of you. Well, if you dream something, it doesn't mean that it's true just because you dream it, but it can be. And in our Inspiring Kids series, you'll meet some kids who are helping their community by turning lemons into lemonade. So it helps parents with diapers, wipes, and anything that could help little babies under the age of three. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Dylan Dreyer, filling in for Lester, who's on assignment. It's so great to be back here with you. All right, get ready. We have a jam-packed program in store for you this week. We're going to catch up with our friend Lily from Lily's Toy Box. She's helping kids that lost everything in the Hawaii wildfires. Actor Matthew McConaughey is telling us all about his new book, Just Because, and will put your knowledge of school supplies to the test. But first, we want to bring your attention to something that happened overseas in Morocco. They had a large earthquake that destroyed some towns and lots of people lost their lives. I wanted to learn more about earthquakes so that I could be prepared in the event one happened here. So I asked a scientist a few questions. And kids, you may want to grab a parent or grown up to watch this with you in case you have any questions. An earthquake is basically a very intense shaking of the Earth's surface. The surface of the Earth is a little bit like a rubber band. You can stretch it and stretch it, but at some point, there will be too much stress and it will break. To understand why earthquakes happen, you must first take a look at the Earth's makeup. The Earth is a little bit like an egg in the sense that it has layers. An egg has a shell and the white part and a yolk, and the Earth has a crust and inside it two other layers called the mantle and the core and that crust is broken up into a number of big pieces kind of like a jigsaw puzzle and those pieces which are called plates move around really slowly one past another. These plates are constantly moving but we only feel them when an earthquake occurs. Why? Well it has a lot to do with the edges of these jigsaw puzzle pieces or plates. At the edges where they're touching they're sometimes stuck together and stress builds up until a point where it breaks and that's where you get an earthquake because there's movement on what's called a fault, a big crack in the ground. So an earthquake occurs when two plates of earth suddenly slip past one another, causing the ground to shake. That earthquake releases a lot of energy that travels through the crust as seismic waves that make the shaking that we feel in an earthquake. Kind of like when you throw a pebble into a lake and you see the ripples moving out. And so then when they reach us at the surface of the earth, they start to shake the ground. Experts say earthquakes happen all the time, but the vast majority of them are so small, we don't actually feel them. Magnitude is the most common measure of an earthquake's size. The intensity of the shaking that we feel where we are during that earthquake depends on many things. How far away the earthquake was, what kind of soil is in the ground below you, what kind of building you might be in. So that's why it may feel stronger or less strong for different people. A very strong earthquake shook parts of Morocco last week. The ground shook so much that buildings collapsed. Many people lost their homes. Our friend Raf Sanchez is there. We're in the village of Moulay Brahim. We're about 30 miles east of the epicenter of Friday's 6.8 magnitude earthquake. And you can see the damage around me. This tower is all that's left of what was once the local shrine. Why did this happen? Well, remember the surface of the earth is divided into those jigsaw pieces? Experts think one of the plates moved north, colliding with another plate, causing the earthquake. 
As for all that devastation, some of the buildings were not built to modern standards, which made them more likely to be destroyed when the earthquake happened. Earthquakes can occur anywhere, including here in the United States. They're not uncommon in places like Alaska, Washington State, Oregon, and California. When you have two plates coming together, there are often many faults in that region. And California is a great example where we have on the western side the Pacific plate and on the eastern side the North American plate. And there are a number of active faults in the region that passes through California. It's common for aftershocks, usually smaller quakes, to occur for days, weeks, and even months after the main earthquake. It's important to study the history of earthquakes. They can provide scientists with clues into where the next major earthquake might be. We know this can sound scary, but there are some things you and your family can do to help protect yourselves in the event of an earthquake. One important thing that you can do is to get underneath a sturdy piece of furniture if you start to feel shaking, hold on to it, and cover your head. And that is called drop, cover, and hold on. You should also get down low if you're outside. But first, remember to try to move away from any buildings to an open area that's not near any structures, trees, or utility poles, and stay down low until the shaking stops. Well, I certainly feel better after that chat. Sometimes, you know, learning about a subject makes it a little less scary. And now on to one of the other top stories making headlines this week. 19-year-old Coco Goff won the U.S. Open. She sat down with our friends Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb and told them all about it. Congratulations. Oh. I have to say, every time we see Coco, we like run, attack, squeal. <laughs> and we're just lunatics because we are just so amazed by you and so happy for you. How are you feeling in this moment? It's still crazy. I don't think it's digest. Like, even last night, I was telling myself, you're a Grand Slam champion. And I'm like, it doesn't feel real at all. Watching that moment where you were laying down on the court, and you just had about 10 seconds there where it was all kind of sinking in. What did that moment feel like to know you'd done it? It felt like it hit all at once because I didn't want to tell myself it was match points on the match points. I didn't want to start shaking. So when it happened and it like finally then it was over. Like my previous matches has taken me like six, seven match points to win. And that one was on the first one. So I was a little bit shocked and I like couldn't breathe either. <laughs> oh. You made a couple of calls right after uh, the match from home court. <laughs> Those calls were not answered. Who, who were they calls to? Both my brothers were the first two people I called. They didn't answer. Then I called my grandma and then somebody, somebody that wasn't her answered. And then finally, <laughs> and finally my brother called me back. But by then the ceremony had started. Um, and he was like, yeah, I was running around the house and I didn't hear my phone ring. But I'm used to him not answering my calls. But I was like, he saw me on the camera, like, calling him. Why did he answer the phone? I bet you cannot <laughs> wait to see those little boys oh, and yeah. give them a hug. Yeah, yeah, they're going to act like they're too cool for school when I see them. But I saw the videos when I'm match point. They were definitely running around the house oh. going crazy. Your your mom and dad, obviously, in the stands and cheering you on. You, you said your dad had a shirt on that said, imagine. What yes. did that mean to you? Um, for me, he just said he bought it at the beginning of the tournament and he said that he had an image that I was going to go make it to the final and he was going to wear that shirt if I did. And I think just imagine, just imagine that your dreams can come true. How fun! Thank you, Savannah and Hoda. Coco's win was so exciting. We decided to make the moment she received her trophy our picture of the week. Look at that smile. Do you ever wonder how much that trophy weighs? Congratulations again, Coco. We turn now to Hawaii. Remember we told you about those devastating wildfires that swept through the island of Maui about a month ago? Well, families lost everything, their homes, cars, and some even lost loved ones. We can only imagine how scary it was, especially for the kids that lived there. Naturally, our pal Lily DuBose sprang into action. We brought you the story of Lily's toy box last year. Lily collects toys for kids in need and the children of Hawaii have been on her mind. So far, she's collected hundreds of toys and the Convoy of Hope is helping her get all those toys over to the island. Thank you, Lily, for your kindness towards those in need. All right, are you guys ready for a pop quiz? This week, the subject is about a pretty common school supply the eraser. Before pencils were manufactured with built-in erasers, what food was commonly used to erase mistakes? Is it A, chewing gum, B, white bread, or C, 
milk. Hmm, that's a tough one. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, ready? The answer is B, white bread. In the year 1770, philosopher and theologian Joseph Priestley discovered a substance that did a great job of erasing pencil marks, rubber. That same year, British engineer Edward Naren went on to invent the first rubber eraser, but it wasn't until 1958 when the first pencil and eraser combo was patented and sold. All right, all right, all right. Actor Matthew McConaughey wrote his first children's book. It's called Just Because. As so many of you know, growing up isn't always easy. And Just Because is a collection of life lessons to help you navigate some tough situations. Here with more is our kid correspondent, Jackson Daly. All right, Mr. McConaughey, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Good to be sitting with you, Jackson. So we're here to talk about um, your new book, Just Because. And uh, can you tell me a little about the book? Yeah. So I got three kids, Livingston, Vita, Levi. Levi's your age, 14. You know, I mean, y'all are seeing things for the first time, trying to get your identity down, you know, and it, people are saying, you gotta, gotta feel this way, you gotta believe this way, you gotta be this, and you're like, hey, I'm trying to work it all out, man. Let me, let me, let me measure, you know, things in the world. You're, all, all of these, all of these things that are going on in the world that you run into. The book is kind of letting kiddos and young people know, hey, be easy on yourself. You can have dueling feelings. You can have two opposing feelings about the same, same, same situation at the same time. This growing up thing is 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 hard. But uh, once we can admit that it's hard, once we can admit that sometimes, hey, uh, I'm not sure how to feel or I'm kind of confused or frustrated, once we can admit that, we can each better deal with it ourselves. And so it's a book that's letting, letting young people know, hey, the contradictions, it's okay. It's all right, man. It's part of the deal. It's part of living. It's part of growing up. There are many just because in this uh, book. What just because is your favorite? Um... Which one would it be? Just because it's fiction doesn't mean it can't be true. I like Just that because one. you want one more doesn't mean that you need two. What I, what I like about that is, look, you know, we all have dreams. We dream something. A lot of times we're told, oh, don't worry about that. That's just a dream. You know, just deal with what's in front of you. Well, if you dream something, doesn't mean that it's true just because you dream it, but it can be. And then the second part of that couplet, just because you want one more doesn't mean that you need to. Now we all know this deal, whether it's a cookie, whether it's candy, well, yeah, I want another one, but I may not need another one, you know what I mean? And uh, uh, I, I like that couple, because I've been in that situation, I've seen my kids in it too. Why did you decide to write the children's book? This children's book actually came from a dream I had. 2.30 in the morning, I woke up. And I had this little, I had this little ditty and I had this little rap. And I was like, just because I forgive you doesn't mean that I still trust. There's what you do, there's what I do, and yours is not my must. And so I found the hook and I got up and I just started jamming and writing these, writing all these couplets down. And I thought I really had this super cool song, which it kind of is. And then I looked at it and I was like, man, this is stuff that my kids are interested in. This is stuff that I think would be valuable for them. This is stuff that I'd like to talk to them about. So I ran a bunch of the couplets past them and we had great conversations. And they understood some things. And heck, I even understood some things. It made me question some things and answer some questions. And I was like, you know what? This might be valuable to put out there in the world for young people and parents to, to have a dialogue about. And so here it is, just because. Here it is, just because. There's obviously a strike going on, so we can't talk about movies, but what would you like kids to take away from the strike? Take away from the strike that in life, and you can start now. Don't have to wait till you're an adult. But if there's something, if you have some rights that you believe in, that you want to stand up for, that may not be how the status quo, how the world says it's supposed to go, but you're like, no, I want to make a stand about this. This doesn't feel fair to me. Make a stand, it's a demonstration. You know, making stands can come in the form of protest. I think they're most effective when they're demonstrations, when you actually show the other side, here's how it could be more fair. Here's my argument. Whether that, you know, I've talked to my kids before. 
they had a they were at school and no and they didn't they weren't liking the lunch right yeah and i was like well what are you gonna do about it and they're like well i don't know i said you gotta eat lunch right and they're like yeah i said well go poll other other kids in the school see if they like the lunch and they came back the next day they're like i got a list of 40 people 40 kids that don't like lunch i was like okay now you're getting somewhere you're building a coalition now why don't y'all sign a petition go to the school board and talk about what it is how the how the lunch could be better and maybe this company that's doing the lunches now can improve their food or maybe you get a new chef or you get a new you get a new lunch line and so they did it and it took them a few weeks and months but it, it and what happened is that the, the 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 school the company that did the school lunches greatly improved and got menus that the kids wanted that also were still pretty healthy and the food food improved you know, I should do that in my school. Sounds like get, get your numbers together. Get your, you get enough of y'all together, people listen. If you could go back and give advice to your younger self about anything in life, yep. what would you say to yourself? Don't rush. Meaning, when I was young, I always wanted to be older because I had older brothers. And I wanted to be 18. I wanted to be 21. I wanted to be a father because I saw how much respect my dad got. But I think I, I wanted to be older so bad that I, I, I missed out on some of my young years. Meaning like, you're 14, you're only gonna be 14 once. Don't rush to be 15, it's coming. You know, whatever age you're, you're eight out there, don't rush to be nine, it's coming. Because you're, you're experiencing your age in things for the very first time. And once you become an adult, you don't run into as many brand new things as often. Appreciate those first times. Don't try to rush past them because they're, you only get a first impression once and you get most of your first impressions when you're young. What advice would you give to kids who want to start doing whatever interest they have? Two things. It's what do you have an innate ability for? What is, your, what is an inherent talent you have? For what you're going to choose to do, that can become work or a career. Now, think of that, and are you willing to work and go get educated and get better and become an expert in that? Ask yourself if what I'm inherently good at and what I'm willing to work for, does the world demand it? Is there demand in the world for it? Because if you get that, then you're in business. Yeah, I gotta write these things down. Oh, I'm gonna be honest, That's kind of all I had for you today. Thank you. Cool, man. That's a lot. That's easy fun, Jackson. That was great. Thanks, Jackson. I think I'm going to pick up a copy of Just Because for my boys. I'm sure it'll come in handy as they get older. Finally, it is time for our Inspiring Kids series, a group of Virginia kids turning lemons into lemonade. All their proceeds from sales go to an organization that helps families in need. Here's our friend Kristen Dahlgren with our report. Last week in Charlottesville, Virginia, this group of kids spent their Labor Day making a difference, selling lemonade for a good cause. I wanted to do it and then I was like, and then my mom, it would be too much for just one kid to do on it though. Yeah, because last year I helped out too. So I thought this year I would help out too. For good friends Audrey and Susanna, this is the second year of selling lemonade. Last year they donated their proceeds to Bright Kids, a charity that helps orphans who've been affected by the war in Ukraine. Last year we raised money for orphans in Ukraine when the war had started. And then this year we did one for Stepping Stone. With the help of friends and family, they raised over $1,500 for a charity called Stepping Stone, an organization that helps newborns and toddlers in need. So it helps parents with diapers, wipes, and anything that could help little babies under the age of three. A day off spent helping, and one that Audrey, Susanna, and their families hope will continue for years to come. We sort of asked them, you know, do you want to think about animals or the climate or other kids? And these last both years, they've chosen kids. It gives me great pride that it's something that they want to do. Um, so I'm hoping that we're able to continue it and have it continue to grow. 
Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at NBCUni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks so much for watching, and remember to be kind to one another.